Welcome back to another UFC fight prediction video. In this video, I'll be predicting the prelim fights for UFC 234, Whitaker versus Gaslam. As I've already predicted the main card fights in another video, so without further ado, let's get to our first fight of the night, our first prediction of the night. So in our first fight, we have in the Bantamweight division, Waluigi Barron versus Jonathan Martinez. You got 0-2 versus 0-1. John Martinez, even though he like debuted in the UFC, he doesn't have any wins in the UFC. He's 0-1. He debuted against a very credible opponent in Andre Sukumtov on short notice. And at the time, he was a flyweight who was coming up to bantamweight. Though he's a bantamweight in this fight because I guess the, the flyweight division has been dissolved or possibly been dissolved, so he's sticking around at bantamweight. When he first came up, it was a very short notice, and he had to you know, just come in as he was. He didn't really get a chance to build into the weight. I'm assuming he's going to be a little bit bigger this time or maybe just more adjusted by time. But even then, he held a good account for himself. Short notice fight. A bigger fighter. I think he even stole the second round. So he had a, a good account for himself in that debut against a very credible opponent. He lost, but a, a credible opponent. With Wuliji Burrow, I really haven't seen anything too credible about him. He is tough. He is durable, but really hasn't impressed me with anything he does. And as far as these, how these two matches, I think it's going to play out more so on the feet. But I think if it goes to the grappling, I think Martinez is the better grappler there as well. But what I think the real biggest thing to take about this fight or the biggest thing to look at in this fight is their output. Wuliji Burrow, he's not Mayweather, but he doesn't throw that, mo that, mo that, like, that many strikes. Whereas Jonathan, Jonathan Martinez throws pretty much twice as many strikes as him, and he's more accurate as well. So he throws more strikes, he's more accurate than you. You might be like one inch taller, but it was even matter when he, he's throwing more strikes. He's a little bit more technical streak. He brings a little bit more, so he's faster than you, throws more to you, more accurate than you. I think that's really all that you really need, need to look at right there. So the grappling is going to be go, going to lean to Martinez. Then on the feet, Martinez throws way more strikes, way more accurate, way faster. And that's really tell the takes on. Like, I don't think Burns is necessarily a hard hitter. And even against Sukumtov, Sukumtov couldn't finish Martinez. He was throwing the whole kitchen sink at Martinez, but Martinez gritted that out against a much higher level level fighter. So this fight is going to play out mostly on the feet, and Martinez is going to win based off volume and work rate. He's going to outwork him, going to throw more strikes in him, and win a decision. So in this fight, I got Jonathan Martinez via decision. Now, on to our next fight we have in the lightweight division Callan Potter versus Jalen Turner. So you got two big, healthy lightweights. I think one's like 6'2", one like 6'3". So two big, long lightweights. Jalen Turner debuted in the UFC on short notice against Vicente Luque, who's one of the scariest dudes in the welterweight division. And pretty much runs through everybody he fights. If he does beat him, he like knocks him out in brutal fashion or like Darsh chokes them. And then and Jalen Turner actually had a good account for himself until he got knocked out with like three minutes into the fight. But he was might have actually been winning up until the knockout. But he was looking good for himself, looking crafty enough. He was looking... Using his range very well, but um, he got caught. He's fighting against a very good fighter who eventually found his range and then tagged him. And that's one of the best strikers in the welterweight division, like top five easily in my opinion. But and it was on short notice, a lot of different things. It was kind of you know really ba like bad on the UFC to throw him in there with such a killer, especially like a fighter who just debuting in the UFC that has a lot of talent as well. You know, when just throw him to the sharks just to jump off from the jump. And you got Colin Potter. Well, Matter of fact, I'm not even going to go through them. But look, as far as looking at these two, how they match up, Callum Potter, they're both big. But Callum Potter is more like a plotting striker. He doesn't really use his range too much. He could fight somebody like 5'9", and he'll be squared up and be trading punches with them instead of using that range to keep them away, like hit them and not be hit. You got all that range, all that height, but you be, but he trades shots with smaller fighters when he doesn't need to. You got Jalen Turner, who's a tall fighter as well, but he actually uses that range. He'll throw teeth pierce to keep the distance, throw jabs, throw straight. A lot of shots, and he lose, use movement. He uses a lot of different things to maximizes the range whereas Colin Potter won't and I also think John, Jalen Turner does a much better job of mixing the like the shots up like he go mixing like high mixing low mixing mid like whereas Colin Potter most times more so like a head hunter almost with his strikes might throw leg kicks here and there but more so head hunter normally mixing too many body shots where Jalen Turner will tack your leg tack your head tack your body mix it up he's faster sharper and as far as grappling, I think it's just about even as far as the grappling. I think what's going to dictate is who will dictate the striking. That will set up the takedown if it needed. Like I said, I think Jalen Turner just mixes up a much better. So he'll be the one dictating whether the fight's on the feet or grappling. And I think he'll keep it on the feet for the most part in this tag turn. I mean, Potter up, being the faster fighter, being the more technical fighter on the feet. And I think he'll take him to decision. So in this fight, I got Jalen Turner via decision. Now to our next fight we have in the lightweight division, Lando Venata versus Marcos Rosa. So looking at this fight, I don't know why this fight even happened. I guess it's, they're giving Van Venado a reward for, you know, being a fan-friendly fighter. You got Marcus Rosa, a guy who's like 8-5, and five, never fought anybody. And he he lost. Then he beat a guy who's like like 2-8 and eight or something like that, or 0-8, oh and, and knocked him out in like 33 seconds. So he knocked out basically a super can. 
he's a can himself. He knocked out a super can, and now he's getting a UFC fight against Bernardo. So it only seems like they're doing this to, um, I guess, give Bernardo a win. That's what it seemed like. So that's pretty much what I'm going to say. I think Bernardo hasn't lost anybody bad. He lost to Tony Ferguson. He lost to some other fighters who, like, either been making the statements in the UFC, made statements in the UFC, or look like they will make statements in the UFC. And guys that had good wins, might have been championships, champions in other, other organizations are, you know, real good, solid prospects and not just, you know, literal cans. People that, and it's not like he lost them bad. He lost some close fights to good competition, whereas Mark Rosas has lost and beaten poor competition. So in this fight, I think Venado's going to be able to just get that first round knockout, take, pick him apart and just show him that He's leagues and leagues above, like above this Rosa guy. So in this fight, I got Lando Venata via first round TKO. Now to our next fight, we have in the bantamweight division, Teruto Ishihara versus Kiyong Ho Kang. So Teruto Ishihara came to UFC, dog. He was gonna like do much more. He had that personality and stuff, like that funny backstory. Training on the team Alpha Mill, so it seemed like he would do well. Like defending against Bradley, he has that that heavy right hand. So looking like he'll have the stuff he needs to, um, you know, be successful in the UFC. But that was not the case. And also, I seem like he, even though he trained at a wrestling gym or a gym with a lot of wrestlers, like his takedown defense isn't the best. His grappling defense is pretty solid, but his wrestling, like just getting taken down and, you know, laid on, he doesn't do the best job at that. Like, he doesn't do the best job at defending or getting back his feet to strike. And against Keon Kang, who's a fighter who's very good at, like, been taking you down, have been heavy on top and just smothering you, that's not a good style. To, I mean, that's not a good style to have, but that's not a good holes to have or a good weakness to have. And the Keon Kang in the last fight showed that strike has come along as well. So he'll be able to keep it at distance and avoid that heavy right hand. And then when it gets close, he'll be able to t- take him down and just smother him. I think that'd be the tell it like you know, that's pretty much that'll be how the fight will play out in my opinion, or how I'll see the fight playing out. Him keeping the distance, then when he wants to take it down, he'll take it down. When each hour starts getting too close, he'll set up takedowns and just grind him out. So in this fight I got Kiyong Ho Kang via decision. Now on to our next fight we have in the flyweight division, Kai Kara France versus Raleon Paiva. So Raleigh and Pai have a good record, like 18 and 1. Even beat a pretty solid fighter to win his contender series fight to get in the UFC. Like a split decision, very good fight. But what I like at Raleigh and Paiva's style, like his um striking really isn't the best to me. I think it's pretty average. And he's kind of slow for a flyweight. Flyweight's supposed to be much faster, and he's kind of slow by flyweight standards. His striking, like I said, kind of poor in my opinion, or like kind of average to poor. It's more so instead of like he kind of covers his weaknesses by this forward pressure and this throwing volume, but it's not the cleanest striker. And you go against Kai, against Kai Car France, who is a high level striker, who'll be able to pick him apart with those, you know, with that pretty poor striking. He's not going to be somebody that's going to just let him engage in that sloppy type of striking. He'll be able to counter those forward blitz with check hooks and be able to use movement, be able to step off the side, catch him overhands, maybe even throw a head kick in there, body kicks, and just pick him apart. And Paiva doesn't really have the best takedown defense. He does have some submission wins on his record. Like, so his graph is pretty solid. And in his fight, it looked pretty solid. We look at the people he actually submitted. The only people he submitted were like 0 and 3, 0 and 2. He submitted guys who are below amateurish or about, matter of fact, below amateurish guys. That's the only people he submitted. He has a jiu jitsu was solid, but is it really that scary? I don't think so. I think Kai Car France would be able to keep on the feet. And even if it goes to the ground, I think Kai Car France would be able to get back up. I think he's a much faster fighter, a much sharper striker. I think he picks him apart on the feet, keeps on keeps it standing, and picks him apart on the feet. And I see a second round stop it. So in this fight, I got Kai Car France via second round TKO. Now on to our next fight, we have in the featherweight division, Shane Young versus Austin Arnett. So looking at this fight, you got Austin Arnett, who came off a pretty pretty good performance. It was like he about to get cut from the UFC, then he kind of was losing that first round against Humberto Bodine. Bodine started to slow down, Austin Arnett turned it up, and he completely changed the trajectory of that fight, and just took it away and won a decision over Bodine, kept his UFC, his, I guess, kept his UFC contract. You got Shane Young. Pretty solid striker. He likes to lean back. That's like one of his weaknesses, in my opinion. He does it too much. I guess see Adesanya doing all the time, so he wants to do it, but he, he does it way too many times just for anything. And that might be his one weakness, but I don't think Austin never really has the most power because he was catching um what's called Dewadu a couple of times with that straight, but um it's like it, it didn't really rock Badu. I mean, it didn't rock Dewadu, but um it's caught his attention, so his power is not the best. We look at his how he fights at this level of MMA. It's more so like he's big, he's durable, and he can outlast you. He's skilled in just about every area, but it's more so he's big and he'll outlast you. But against Shane Young, that's this is a fighter who's always in your face, always pushing the face, always well conditioned. I think he's faster. He has more power. I think he'll be able to dictate where to, dictate where to you know the pace of the fight and where the fight goes and keep it on the feet. And if he wants to take it down, he'll be the one taking it down instead of allowing Arnett to take it down. 
And I think that's what's going to be telling. I think he'll be faster, sharper, hit harder, and he'll be able to dictate the pace and he won't slow down. He'll be in your face the whole time. He's a well-conditioned fighter and that's part of his style to be in your face, to smother you with his pressure, with his striking. And if he wants to, with his grappling. I think more so with his striking, what he does. He gets in your face, hits you with hard shots, L- loves that straight, love those straight line strikes. He does got some pretty good hicks, hooks. I say hicks, but whatever. <laughs> I think he's just a better striker to simplify. I think he's a better striker and I think he'll be able to push the pace the whole time. He's a well-conditioned fighter as well, so he can't, won't expect no slowdown from Shane Young. So in this fight, I got Shane Young via decision. Now to our prelim headliner, which is not actually our prelim headliner. At first it was, you know, in different positions. Like they had the, the um, Devontae Smith fight on the main card, but now the Montana De La Rosa fights on the main card. So if you want to look at the Devontae Smith um, prediction, that's on my main card video. But the Montana De La Rosa fight will be the main, like the last prediction for this card. I mean, our last prediction for this video is I've already predicted the Devontae Smith fight on the other video. So whatever, whatever the case is. On to our last prediction. So in our last prediction, we have in the women's flyweight division, Montana De La Rosa versus Nadia Kasim. So look at Nadia Kasim. She's 5-0 undefeated. So a lot of hype around her just from the fact that she's 5-0. And we look at who she's beat. Only one of the fighters she's fought has actually won a fight. The other two are like, other four are like 0-2, 0-3, 0-4, 0-5, something like that. But none of them have wins. Not when she fought them. And not to this day, they have no wins. The only fighter she's beat is now 5-5. Five and five. She beat a 5-4 and four, um, Alex Chambers, who's 39. Yes, they trained together. Yes, she had a struggling weight cut. And yes, all this and stuff and that. But yeah, and like when you clearly see like she was getting these first round knockouts and TKOs over these lesser tier competition fighters. Then the moment she f- took a step up in competition and fought a fighter with some wins, a fighter with a little bit of experience, she struggled. She had a, got taken out four times. I think only landed, outlanded her by five strikes. It was a very close fight. You look at Montana De La Rosa. She's been fighting this level of competition. In her last two fights, she's been stopping them. She submitted Rachel Ostevich. I think it'd be a rare naked choke, I believe. She submitted um this um other chick. I forgot her name right now, but she I think was like armbar. But a respectable competition that had fought in like the higher levels of women's MMA, and she's stopped them. She's picked them apart on the feet. When it went to the ground, she tapped them out. I think this fight, I think that's what's going to come down. I think Montana De La Rosa has shown that she can fight at this level of competition and that she could dominate at this level of competition. With Nadia Kasim shows that she's struggling just to get to this level of competition. I think maybe the wake up might have an effect, but when you look at her, we look at what you can have to draw off of, there's really nothing to draw off. She's been beating, like, basically amateurs off the street. If they're 0-2, they don't have wins. And then she beat, struggled to beat a 39-year-old who's 500. I think Montana De La Rosa is going to be, just to use that experience, I think striking that around the same level. And if not, Montella Rosa being better, just all the fact that she's fought, actually proving herself against higher level competition. I think she'd be able to pick her apart on the feet or, you know, just edge her on the feet. Then if Kasim gets, pan- gets panicked and try to take her to the grappling, I think Della Rosa would be able to handle her there. And she's shown that she's been able to submit high level competition. And that's really going to come down. She's going to pick her up, like edge her in the first two rounds. Then the third round, Kasim's going to panic and try to, you know, make something happen. Maybe try to take down, get over aggressive. I think Della Rosa is going to counter that aggression. Make it a grab the match in this submitter, tap her out. So in this fight, I got Montana De La Rosa via third round submission. And that concludes my fight predictions for the prelims of UFC 234, Whitaker versus Gaslam. Thanks for watching. Like, comment, and subscribe, and come back for more videos. Peace.